I will admit uh, the reason that I am up here, that being that David is not uh, up to par, so we uh, truly regret that, but that is the fate, I think, of just a human condition, that sometimes we're beset with infirmities that prevent us from doing perhaps what we want to do. But I am glad to be able to stand up here today and uh, talk to you about certain things that that I want to talk to you about. That's a good thing about uh, these sorts of times. And of course today is uh, the day that where we will have this special contribution. And as I explained, you know, how that will uh, happen later. There's a little confusion about that, but sorry about that, but hopefully we got that corrected. But I want to talk to you today about that, you know. Uh, I know if John were up here, he says he always has something to say and doesn't know where to, when to quit. But I always present very short lessons. <clears throat> so that's a blessing, is it not? <laughs> But uh, giving of our uh, financial means is, uh, that's a peculiar aspect of uh, Christian living. In fact, it may be a, just a, a exceedingly odd aspect of Christian living. The not material things that have the potential to bring joy and contentment are the very things that uh, are avoided. We avoid them. We, we go after the material things, not the things that really bring joy and uh, contentment. So what I, I want to discuss today is the uh, imperative, but also the blessing of giving. We often need to be reminded of the advantages promised to those who help the poor. For example, Psalms. Uh, 41st Psalm, verses 1 and first part of that. Now, the peerless apostle Paul demonstrated his generosity in giving not in material resources, for he had none, but in providing for himself by the labor of his own hands so that his uh, ministry would not be a burden to others. He reminded his brethren with Jesus' own commentary on the benefits of generosity. He says, I have shown you in every way by laboring like this, you know, working with his own hands, that you must, more, that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. So blessing, uh, giving is a blessing. That's in Acts 20, chapter verse 35. You want to make a notation of that. Now, I don't think anyone uh, would dispute that the United States is a wealthy nation, by, at least by world standards. Now, this is not to say there is no poverty here or that prosperity comes without effort because neither one is true. As an example, in the United States, nationally, we spend more on pet food than we do in charitable religious giving. And of course, in some parts of the world, people eat pets rather than feed them. So we are uh, kind of unique in that. But with great prosperity comes great responsibility. And this is not a modern problem, not peculiar to us. It's been with us throughout the ages. For example, in Deuteronomy, the 15th chapter, verses 12 through 14, the instruction was to, quote, if your brother, a Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman, is sold to you and serves you six years, then in the seventh year, you shall let him go free from you. And when you send him away free from you, you shall not let him go away empty-handed. 
You shall supply him liberally from your flock, from your threshing floor, and from your wine press. And that was the sources of their wealth, wealth in that day. From what the Lord has blessed you with, you shall give to him. And also in Malachi 3rd chapter verse 10, Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. In chapters 8 and 9 of 2 Corinthians, Paul gives six, ar six arguments to motivate the brethren in needed libera liberality. First, there's the example of their own past, uh, verse 7 of chapter 8. Second, there's the example of others, uh, specifically the Macedonians, chapter uh, 8, uh, verses 1 through 6, and then chapter, I meant to verse uh, 8. Number three, the example of Jesus in the ninth verse of chapter 8. Fourth, there is the need to put intentions into practice. That's in verse 11 of chapter 8. Fifth, there is the understanding that God expects only what one can do, not what is an impossibility. That's in verse 12. And number six, the satisfaction and contentment that giving will bring the giver. That's in verse six of chapter nine. In Paul's first epistle to the Corinthians, they were instructed <clears throat> on the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. Of course, he recognized that as the second verse of chapter 16 of 1 Corinthians. They had been favorably, favorably disposed to fulfill this command, but they had been negligent in its fulfillment. Hence, numerous admonitions are found in 2 Corinthians. You look at the uh, first 15 verses of chapter 1. And so we'll examine some of those uh, numerous admonitions. And I may or may not read all of <coughs> chapter 8 of Second Corinthians, but in the first two verses it says, Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that in a great trial of affliction the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. <clears throat> now Paul introduced the... Uh, thought and idea that giving and serving others is a privilege or grace, if you will. Paul told them that he wanted them to know uh, the privilege bestowed on the Macedonians. Uh, later in verse uh, 7, the Corinthians were challenged to abound in this grace also. Giving is a, an open door, an opportunity not only to do good for someone in need, but to display genuine Christianity. In Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verse 28, brethren were, were told to labor, working with their own hands, that they may have something to give him who has need. <clears throat> Earning money uh, was only a means towards the end that others uh, might be assisted not merely the accumulation of wealth. Paul expressed his appreciation to the Philippian brethren for their support of his necessities and were told that he was not really seeking the gift towards his support, but rather he sought the fruit produced by such giving that abounds to their account. And that's found in Philippians, the fourth chapter, verses 14 through 17. While in great poverty themselves, the Macedonian brethren, in the abundance of their joy, sought the opportunity to give. 
The Corinthians, on hearing this, hopefully realized their responsibility to give as they had previously promised while understanding the great blessing and joy that comes with generosity. The city of Corinth was a prosperous city because of its location as a you know, a commercial bridge between uh, Greece and the other parts of the Roman Empire. If you get a map out, you can see how centrally located it is and how uh, critical it was to trade between those areas. It may not be that uh, the individual Corinthian uh, brethren are rich, but based on 1 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, verse 8, they were most assuredly better off financially than their Macedonian brethren. At any rate, they thought they were rich and reigned as kings, while Paul and his companions were anything but that. Undoubtedly, they, had, uh, they were better situated to show liberality than the Macedonians and had expressed the intention of, of uh, expressing their liberality by their contribution. <clears throat> now, the Macedonians, uh, poor by any uh, measure, learned the true joy of giving while the Corinthians had only contemplated doing so. You find that in uh, 1 Corinthians 8, chapter verses 10 through 12. Not until they learn to give will they know genuine joy, much less provide vital assistance to, the, to those who needed it so much. In contrast, the Macedonians, despite the, their great trial of affliction and deep poverty, the abundance of their joy abounded in the riches of their liberality. We find that in 2 Corinthians 8, chapter verses Two through three. In verses, uh, I'll just read verses three and four of Second Corinthians eight. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and fellowship of the ministering to the saints. <clears throat> Now, the New Testament demands that our giving be done regularly, personally, proportionately, liberally, bountifully, cheerfully, purposefully, and willingly. In 1 Corinthians 16, 2 that we read, uh, we instructed to give as we have been prospered. Now, exactly how much is that? That's a valid question, to be sure. It does act as a limit on our giving, but it is not an absolute limit. We understand that on an occasion we can exceed that limit. Consider the widow, widow's mites and the Macedonians. Again, Scripture does not specify the absolute limit of our capability to give. How much the Macedonians gave individually and collectively is not said. But what they did give surprised even Paul, one who was accustomed to giving all to the cause of Christ. Paul bore witness that according to their ability, <clears throat> And beyond, they freely gave and implored Paul, who may have hesitated to accept the gift from ones so impoverished, and he implored, they implored him to receive their gift and consequently the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. <clears throat> so, giving was an act of fellowship of the Gentile Christians in Macedonia with Jewish Christians in Judea. The Macedonians saw a need and they wanted to fulfill that need, at least in part, to the extent they could. Now, there are many charities today. I know you all uh, 
have the emails, and you get a lot of these uh, uh, requests for charity, for donations, what, mostly it's political now, <laughs> this is political season. But there are a lot of charities today that uh, they express a legitimate need and for someone or something or that in and of itself is a worthwhile cause. And many are motivated to uh, contribute towards the fulfillment of those worthy causes and probably right to do so. But in the greatest cause of all, that's the salvation of souls, there's a genuine need there that should challenge us all to support the labor and, and laborers in the fields that are white unto harvest, John 4, 35. In verse 8, uh, chapter 8, verse 5 of, of our text, Paul mentions again the contributions made by the Macedonians, stating that they gave even more than he had hoped. Knowing their deep poverty, their gift was likely small in absolute terms, but proportionally their giving was large just as it was for the widow and her two mites. God knows our ability to give, and he expects only that which is fair. Without a doubt, many others gave as they were prospered, and their gift was accepted. However, at this time, there was a need for an exceptional example of generosity to move the saints in Corinth to cause them to fulfill their unfinished commitment. Unlike those mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11, the Corinthians had not yet obtained a good testimony through faith. Hebrews 11 uh, verse 39. Those mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11 served as an encouragement to the Hebrew Christians who were facing struggles and temptations to remain steadfast in the faith once delivered to the saints. The Macedonian brethren contributed contribution served Corinth in the same manner as an encouragement. But how was it that the Macedonian brethren were able to give beyond their ability? And moreover, why were they so willing? I think the key to understanding why is the phrase, they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. So the proper order is first to the Lord and then to us. They realized something that others had not, that all that we have must be ded dedicated to God. This precept is pervasive throughout the Bible. In the New Testament, this is expressed in the following verses, which is by no means uh, an exhaustive listing. In Luke 14, chapter verse 33, it says, So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. So all that we have belongs to uh, Jesus. In Romans, the 12th chapter, verse 1, <clears throat> a verse familiar to you all, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And in Luke, the ninth chapter, verse 23, and it's also found uh, in Matthew, the 16th chapter, verse 24, 27, and Mark, 8th chapter, verse 34 to 38. But we're going to just do Matthew, Luke 9, 23, since it's one verse. Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. <clears throat> so everything is to be sacrificed uh, to our... Uh, obedience to Christ. And in 1 Corinthians 6 chapter verses 19 through 20, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? 
For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which is God's. Yeah, I'm sure uh, some of you, I'm, I'm sure John has, <coughs> you've heard of the expression, the uh, dry wallet baptisms. Uh, that's where the one being baptized, you know, he wants to take his wallet out. He didn't want his wallet to be baptized. Uh, so that's a, in a powerful expression or story for sure, but it symbolizes uh, that many today do not, uh, have not given their all to God. And in particular, you know, the wallet rep represents the material things. They haven't given their material things to God. So, but giving is more than just money. We understand that. It is also time and effort. Of course, I know that some of you are giving the, the widow's might. You know, I'm a certified public accountant. I deal in numbers. <clears throat> I also deal in old tractors and old cars too, but in this context, I deal in numbers. So I just know uh, these things. Now, I could determine definitively if you are giving as you have been prospered, I think, if I were to do an audit, but I hate auditing. There's, there's an easier, but by no means definitive way of determining that. And uh, Indeed, it is not an appropriate way to determine how, whether you've been prospered or giving it according to being prospered. But you see the uh, contribution on our board back there? Nobody's looking. <laughs> well, just take, you know, take, just at least in your mind, think about that contribution back there. Now, assume that everyone in the congregation, and we only have about, uh, I'm going to be very generous and say 15 families here, probably less than that. Let's say everyone in the congregation is just like you in every respect, including giving, in time, service, all the other aspects. <clears throat> what would the contribution amount be? Who do teaching and preaching, maintain the facilities and so on? Now, as I say, this is not a perfect exercise because it just doesn't give, that's not the way you determine if you're given uh, how you've been prospered. There's so many different uh, aspects to making that determination, you know, different in circumstances demand different outcomes. But don't you think it's an interesting exercise nevertheless? to see if everybody gave exactly as you gave, what that number would be. And I, I uh, say that this is probably, yeah, I, I don't know other, about other congregations, but I would say this is a high cost uh, facility because we have two buildings we have, you know, take care of. Most of our expenses, of course, in, are in salaries and, and things to support salaries. But we have a lot of other expenses too, like uh, uh, insurance. The insurance for this building is almost $8,000 a year. And um, electricity. You know, we used to have, like I, I usually uh, contract for a longer term uh, utility electricity uh, rates. But unfortunately, I had a three-year deal expired during COVID. And thank you, Joe Biden, the rates almost doubled. So during the summer, it ran about $1,800 a month. So it's kind of a high-cost facility. <clears throat> so if you were giving if everybody's giving what you gave, would be, we be able to afford this facility? You have to think about that. But again, I say that is not an appropriate way to determine if you're giving as you have prospered. In verses 7 and 8, Paul mentions 
that the Corinthians abounded in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all diligence, and in their love for Paul and his companions, all commendable attributes. Rather, he says, as they abound in these things, implying that they had come up a little short, that they, if they were to abound in this grace of giving also. Of course, uh, reading the first epistle to the Corinthians, we see they had come up short in all areas mentioned in verse 7. So this is a, a use of irony for which Paul was known. The idea, of course, is that they should abound in all these areas, including their generosity. Perhaps a little self-examination was in order, 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. Paul believed that they could excel in all these areas. Their positive reception of previous rebukes demonstrated that they were teachable and had good and honest hearts. The instruction in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2 uh, was a commandment. But here in chapter 8, he did not use commandment in this context as much as he did motivation and encouragement. And that's the purpose of this lesson, uh, lesson motivation and encouragement. Here he emphasizes the efforts of others and the need to prove that their love was genuine and not superficial. Giving that is only motivated by demand or prescription will never be as abundant as that motivated by generosity and love. The Corinthians were now aware of their privilege to give, their opportunity to assist others. There was one more motivation for them to consider the gift of Jesus Christ and the grace or privilege he enjoyed in giving for us. Christ was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor. This sacrifice of Jesus Christ himself was the most powerful of all incentives available to Paul. The Corinthians were already knowledgeable concerning the gift, or grace if you will, uh, gift of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> This grace was willingly given in Galatians 1 verse 4 and Philippians 2 verse 8 and other places. And that willingness should be reflected in our giving, provided we have a willing mind. Paul used three measures to impress this responsibility on the minds, their minds and ours. Uh, number one, Jesus was rich. He was on an equality with God in the riches of his glory, Ephesians 3rd chapter, verse 16. Yet, number two, he became poor, leaving behind the glory that had been his before the world was, John 17, verse 5. And number, th number three, this was done so that we may be rich through his poverty. We tend to think of riches and poverty in, in material terms. Yet material things perish. Jesus was rich before he came to earth in the flesh. While here he was poor in material things, but rich in things eternal. Paul counted, quote unquote, all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, his Lord, for whom he suffered the loss of all things and counted them as rubbish that he might gain Christ. Philippians, the third chapter, verse 8. Those who were rich in material things were told to store up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. 1 Timothy, the sixth chapter, verse 19. After all, the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. 
2 Peter uh, chapter 3, verse 10. Jesus was rich, but he abandoned those riches to make us rich. This was his gift, his grace to us. The Corinthians knew about this grace, but not, had not learned its true significance. Procrastination is a thief of time. It was good that the Christians in Judea were not in a, an emergency, a dire emergency, or they could not have waited on the Corinthians to fulfill their pledge. There had been a readiness by the Corinthians, but there needed to be a performance of that readiness. This was a case where the thought did not count as performance. They needed to prove the sincerity of their love. The Macedonians had a sincere love and concern for their Jewish brethren in Judea. It caused them to beseech Paul, that's a pleading, to beseech Paul to receive their contribution. When someone is in need but you continue to procrastinate, that is equivalent to that one in James, the second chapter, verse 16. Depart in peace. Be warmed and filled. If you do not give them things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? The Corinthians had a readiness of mind to give, but Paul told them that there must be a completion out of what they had. Paul was telling the Corinthians to quit talking and get it done. So the Corinthians had just so much. I don't know what that was. We don't know how much they had, but they had something. They had something. What prevented them from completing the gift, whether great or small, whatever it was, Paul gets right to the heart of the, their procrastination. There must first be a willingness, or as he says, a, a willing mind. If one has a willingness to give generously, however that is determined, then the acceptance of what is given will be to the degree of what one has and not according to some theoretical amount or potential of possession. God has never expected nor required that we give more than is fair and just. The rich fool in Luke 12, chapter verse 20, was condemned not because he had money or because he was wealthy, because he trusted in his money. The widow gave the two mites, Luke 21st chapter and following, and she was commended because she gave what she could. The so-called rich young ruler only went away sorrowfully when Jesus asked him to give up his material possessions. He was willing to do anything but that. Paul does not intend that any one group should be unduly burdened while another group be eased. He emphasizes that there should be fairness and equity. Did the Corinthians hesitate out of a concern that they would have insufficient resources to sustain themselves? Perhaps. Paul reminds them that God supplied the millions of Israelites leaving Egypt with manna in the wilderness. If God can do that, he can certainly keep a generous people supplied with the means needed to survive. Jesus reminded his disciples that even the birds and the flowers are cared for. And if we will seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, he will provide sufficient food, shelter, and clothing for our needs. Unbelief, or a lack of faith, is the cause of all disobedience. Israel could not enter Canaan under Moses because of unbelief, Hebrews 3rd chapter, verse 19. And Gentiles were alienated from God because of unbelief, Romans, the 11th chapter, verses 9 through 
19 through 23, and there are other, of course, verses that you could uh, uh, reference. Likewise, we fail to seek God in this righteousness, first because of selfishness, a callous form of unbelief. I said selfishness, it's selfishness. <laughs> Words do matter. <laughs> so God uh, has promised to care for us and provide us what we uh, need. But we do not really believe that he can or that he will. On the basis of evidence and in light of our hopes, can we not simply take God at his word? Our hopes built on God's promises are the anchor of the soul, Hebrews 6, chapter verse 19. Will we give for entertainment, but not evangelism? When we really believe God and put our stock in his promises, our contribution to the Lord's work will follow naturally. No matter what the uh, Corinthians uh, assumed, uh, they were not going to be burdened while the others had their ease. I mean, I, I'm just making the assumption that they assumed that. Their gift would bring about an equity, the one they promised, but didn't fulfill. Their gift would bring, bring about an equity, not only for the giver, but for the recipient. In Second Thessalonians 3, verse 10, we are commanded that if anyone will not work, neither should he eat. Equitable treatment is both expected and required. It would be the same for the Corinthians, Macedonian, and Jewish Christians in Judea. Therefore, the Corinthians were required to do their share and to do it without further delay. It may appear that this whole sermon is about money and giving of your means. However, the real subject is our faith in God and our resulting attitude towards his, this world. Once we are ready to put our emphasis on heavenly treasures rather than world uh, pleasures, we will begin to break out of ourselves and with God as our anchor, fight the good fight of faith. And this sermon was not uh, designed as it really appealed to those who are not in Christ, but at this time I want to make that appeal, though, if you have, uh, in the study of your a personal study, you have come to determination that, that uh, you are outside of Christ and need to be in Christ, and the way to do that is to uh, confess him as your Lord and Savior, uh, repent of your sins, and then be baptized into Christ. It may be some of you that have uh, forsaken your first love, so to speak, and if that's the case, you want to make a correction of that, we want to give that opportunity now as we stand and sing. <clears throat>